Um, Javier, are you here with us? Yeah. Um, awesome. Do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Can I, I'll say a couple words, Javier, if you don't mind. Please. Javier was, in, so right now this, okay, you're adjusting that. Um, Javier has been working on how do we take deep learning and build flow circuits that are able to make predictions very quickly for the intergranular, intergranular flow. And, and now Javier having done that is looking at how to move across scales so that we can get closer to flow relevant scales for forecasting. Um, Javier, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, the only problem of going after Dr. Foster is that the bar is pretty high, but uh, I'll do my best to keep the audience entertained. Um, this talk is kind of along the same lines that Dr. Foster was talking about the scientific machine learning aspect of deep learning. Uh, I'm currently working on adding additional constraints to the model that I'm about to show you, but uh, it, so far it works pretty well. And uh, I guess I didn't introduce myself. Uh, my name is Javier and I've been a PhD student with Dr. Michael Birch for like four years now or so. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk to you about our latest project, uh, which we called the MSNet um, because it has to do with uh, multi-scale. I'm also gonna stop my video for a few seconds because um, although I have access to the most powerful computers in the world, my laptop is not as good. So as the summary <clears throat> says here, for the first time, we're proposing a way to train uh, neural networks with big volumetric data. Uh, the model itself that I'm about to present is not constrained to any specific application. Uh, it could be used for, for example, reservoir simulation, uh, geophysical interpretation, maybe populating petrophysical properties in a structured grid, um, um, among others. In, in this presentation, I will specifically talk about flow through porous materials because it's a topic that I like the most. So our main objective in this work is to train a model to understand how fluids behave when traveling to, through a complicated and disordered media while being driven by a pressure gradient. Uh, this goal is specifically tricky in the presence of heterogeneities. Uh, for example, uh, if we have box in our system, or if we have fracture media, or if we have very tight uh, by dispersed materials, uh, for examples. These, all these localized features, they affect the global permeability response. And that's, how, that, that's why this problem is, is hard. Um, and you may ask, why is microscopic flow uh, through porous material relevant to the petroleum industry in general? Um, and I can say that obtaining the permeability of a hard data point, in, in this case, I'm showing a, a little core, is crucial to populate our uh, reservoir scale grids. Um, this could also be done at, at the lab with a variety of experimental setups, uh, but uh, we prefer to do it with the help of a CT scanner and a supercomputer. Um, this, this, is, this method is non-destructive and it gives us additional insights on what's happening inside the sample. And for the ones that are not super acquainted with digital rocks, um, Dr. Masha, my co-advisor, hosts a repository where people from all over the world can upload their samples and share them with the community. Some, some of these samples, is, they are very hard to get or it's very uh, expensive to image. So these are great efforts uh, for uh, scientific collaboration. So the, the, the overall digital rock physics workflow is the following. Uh, first, uh, we select a rock either from an, an, an analogous formation um, hosted on our website or scanned by our company. We, you, we first select a small area of interest, uh, like the one I'm highlighting here in red. And then we segment that area into a binary volume containing pores and grains. Um, in here, they're representing, represented by black and white uh, boxes. Then we set nodes homogeneously throughout this pore space. Um, these nodes are places where the fluid particles can inhabit. 
And then we start our simulation uh, where we collide and stream clusters of particles around the porous material until we reach a steady state. Um, after convergence, the, the simulation provides us with 3D tensors of the velocity components and the pressure of the system. This is a fantastic method uh, specifically for complicated geometries where a finite element method will fail uh, due to the meshing. The problem of, of this method is that it requires a huge amount of computational resources. Um, in this plot, I'm showing some of the running times of some somewhat complicated samples. Uh, these are related to high tortuosity and poor co coordination number uh, between the pores. And we can see that increasingly tight samples like these points, um, the simulator can take up to uh, up to two days running in 100 cores of our supercomputer. So uh, this these, uh, feature makes it hard to, to get deployed as an industrial uh, workflow in a company. So our, our hypothesis is that since the permeability of a sample is correlated to its pore structure, a model should be able to give an accurate estimate based on the 3D image only. And uh, I hypothesize, and this might be a little controversial, that the sample structure versus poros versus permeability relationship is a smooth continuous monolithic manifold where all our solutions live. So parting from this assumption, our task is to kind of craft a uh, model, which in, in this work is a neural network that's able to parameterize the regions of interest of uh, this hypothetical manifold. So for the people that were here last uh, summer, uh, you will remember that uh, our first model was based on a subsampling approach. Um, so in, in that model, we were really hard on the feature engineering uh, side of things to find good proxies for uh, local and global structure. So the, the way uh, this model worked is, is that it subsampled uh, small patches or the, of the domain with its features and it passed them through a gigantic neural network uh, that was able to get the, uh, the, the corresponding patch of our uh, fluid velocity in this case. Um, these work, oops. Oh, there's more patches. Okay. Um, these this uh, uh, model worked pretty decently. It provided uh, a good pix by pix results, as you can see in this cross section. I'm showing the comparison against Lattice Boltzmann and the relative error. There's a point wise relative errors up to 30%, which uh, are acceptable because the, the overall uh, solution is, is pretty accurate. So um, we were able to accurately predict. Uh, to, to predict accurately permeability in a wide variety of samples, including sandstones, carbonates, and some artificially created um, materials. The main problem with this approach was that our window size was way too small for very heterogeneous domains, um, like the fracture that I'm picturing here. You can see that uh, the, the, the subsampling window size um, doesn't capture anything in, in this domain. Uh, we tried several combinations of, of different features, but the model was unable to learn anything useful. So a completely new approach was needed. And a few authors in the recent literature agreed with this uh, statement, and let me read you what they're saying. So Wang, uh, a few months ago, states that one major point of focus for deep learning in physical sciences is the computational cost of working with these massive 3D arrays. Um, he claims that the, the development of architectures are better suited for the problems of interest uh, instead of the usual architectures for 3D classification and segmentation is needed. Um, very often in literature, you find that people just clone a GitHub repository of uh, units and, and trains its uh, physical simulations, which uh, sometimes works, but uh, it's um, not the most desirable thing. And also Al-Qatani, uh, a few months after, mentions that uh, he identified flow through fractures as an outstanding problem in deep learning, because these are very heterogeneous and, and very big. So uh, until then, there were, was not a solution for, 
for these problems. Luckily, we were already uh, working on something by then. So in our previous work, the main limitation was this maximum domain size. It was around 80 cube. Um, it was not able to, to cover much of our domain. Um, in this work, in this new one that I'm uh, about to present you, we're proposing a multi-scale system of lightweight neural networks uh, to be able to train with larger domains. So in this slide, you can see the schematic of our idea. So we uh, part from our, our original image, which in this case is 256 cubed voxels. And uh, we're able to train with this image by pulling our network n times. In, in this case, I'm showing uh, three uh, pullings or, uh, or a mean averaging. Um, so we get different representations at different scales. And I'm going to explain a little bit more in further slides how this works. So the, the main intuition for performing this averaging or pooling is that relationships, they simplify at coarser scales. So in here in the bottom panel, you can see the relationship between fluid velocity and uh, pore structure at each scale. So you can see that in the, in the finest scale, the relationship is kind of a shotgun blast. Uh, there's there's uh, pretty much no relationship. Uh, it's heteroscedastic. It will be very hard to model. Um, what, when, when we pull this image a few times, you can see that it becomes much more apparent and a little bit linear. Um, and so, so we use these, these uh, concepts uh, for designing our network. So we can see that the, the job of the coarsest neural network is to output a very small representation of the velocity field. But this representation includes the main features affecting flow. For example, this representation is going to include uh, the, the flow that's affected by this fracture. So what, what we do after this is we upscale this uh, partial solution, uh, what I call. We, we resize it by a factor of two in this case. And then we pass it to the next neural network along with the, with the next image. And that way, we get a partial solution number two. Um, we do this subsequently until we are able to recover our, our whole uh, fine scale. We tried um, this method with domains up to 850 cubed voxels. So it works pretty well for uh, big guys. And here's a, a summary, a schematic of the whole process. So we start with an image. In this case, it's a porous medium with a fracture, but it could be a reservoir or it could be uh, another thing. And we course it uh, a few times. In, in, in here, the coarsening is done by uh, mean, mean pulling the image, but uh, if it, it could be done by, by another uh, procedure. And then uh, we pass these images to the different neural networks. Uh, the number of scales is a hyperparameter for my project. Four scales worked pretty good. It was a good trade-off between computational complexity and accuracy, but this is not set in stone. So to test the uh, generalization capabilities of our model, we trained it with a single sphere pack. So I grabbed this sphere pack, gave it to a model, and waited until the loss function didn't go down anymore and kind of assess its performance in, in a wide variety of things. So let me show you uh, some of the test samples. Um, we selected samples that were like kind of outstanding in, in digital rock physics, like this pretty ugly carbonate fracture with a huge bug in the middle. Um, we also have a bundle of uh, single uh, fractures. We have a prop fracture, so it's a, a a sandstone propped uh, with uh, some spheres. Um, and we have boggy media, we have x-ray scans, and I'll show you a few cross-sections in the next slide. So in here, you can see uh, two of the results of our network that was trained with sphere packs. Uh, I'm showing the prop fracture and the Castlegate sandstone. And you can see that the relative errors are pretty small even when our training sample was a very easy sample. So one thing that I would like to point out is that creating our entire training set plus training our network took around 12 hours. Um, simulating the sample, this uh, Castlegate sandstone alone, took 15 hours. So um, this is 
uh, a good thing to highlight, but because often people are training these huge neural networks in problems that take uh, very little to, to be solved. So I, I think this is a good uh, test set. And in here, you can see more results. Um, we got pretty acceptable errors. Our highest error was around 38%. Uh, but you can see that the permeability spans um, many orders of magnitude. So this is remarkable because even when uh, people are comparing results, uh, numerical results, different solvers tend to uh, overestimate or, or underestimate permeability by uh, uh, like 20% or so. So these are well in line with the um, current numerical simulation state of the art. And in here, we can see a lot of plots of the permeabilities uh, of the test set. So we have the single fractures, uh, we have a bunch of sands, and the micro CT scans. And uh, yeah, with that, I would like to conclude this test set, but I also would like to invite the audience um, to check our code out. And also, if you have uh, a good labeled uh, data set, either 2D or 3D, that uh, you would like to use to train our model, please let us know. Uh, our model should be very easy to train, and um, I hope it could provide good results. Uh, it could be used for a reservoir simulation, for molecular dynamics, for particle transport. Um, these are a few things that cross my mind, but uh, it's not limited to only this. And uh, here's a shameless plug. I'm graduating next semester. So please let me know if you are interested in training very big image or natural language processing models. And with that, uh, we would like to acknowledge um, our generous sponsors uh, of the consortium. All right, thank you very much, Javier, for the talk. Appreciate it. Excellent. Um, okay to promote yourself graduating, Javier. That's totally fine. This is a good place to do that. Thank you very much for this work. You know what's very interesting is last time, last year, we were using feature engineering to try to capture multi-scale information and embed it into the model, like the concept of uh, distance-weighted permeability or what they call fast marching measures, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can do it all directly. As you said, you have a function of the pores and the solids and you're figuring it out. Yeah, so, so in this work, I'm using the Euclidean distance because Computing, it takes a few milliseconds and uh, it might provide more information than a binary image alone, but uh, I would like to try training the network with just the binary image, just like remove any sort of feature engineering from, from the workflow and see what happens. Awesome, Javier. I see we have a question from Aya. Aya, do you want to go ahead and ask the question? Hi, good, good afternoon. Well, it's, uh, I'm joined from Tokyo. It's a 4 a.m. at the very early morning. Thank you for your presentation. It's, uh, it's a very, um, uh, it's amazing. And if we prefer to provide our volcanic lock, <laughs> in this case, what kind, uh, what do you need? I mean, the rock itself or CT scan image, or what do you need for calculation? So, uh, uh, do, do you mean uh, permeability cal calculation? Yes, yes. So, in, in this workflow, what I do is I, I pair uh, the binary image, so the segmented CT scan, with the lattice Boltzmann simulation. So, that's kind of my workflow. Um, the lattice Boltzmann simulation is done by my collaborator. Um, so, but uh, if, if you have some sort of like label data set like that, we can probably uh, do something about it. it. It will be also really interesting to try to pair the raw micro CT image with the velocity. So without, without the segmentation. Uh, okay, okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the question. We appreciate you staying up with us until 4 a.m. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. And we do welcome the opportunity. Javier has thrown down the challenge. Anyone have a data set, you want to run your model on it. And I think that's awesome, Javier. Appreciate that challenge. Anything else? Any other questions?
John, we can't hear you. Sorry, I had my, my mic muted. Yeah, uh, I know there's quite a bit of so, or there's some heuristic in the images themselves in determining what's pore space and what's green. Like, one thing, and I know Eduardo, I think his next talk, right, is, is the next talk is about tuning dropout, right? I think it would be really interesting to combine the, the, the two of your work where you basically try to get some uncertainty bounds because of the, due to the, this kind of fuzzy area between what's green and, and, uh, and, and, and poor space to look at how you might get uncertainty models uh, depending on what the uncertainty of that sort of heuristic is. I don't, I don't know. If, you, if you're not familiar with Eduardo's work, then you can't comment on it, but maybe, maybe after his talk, we can, we can talk about it. John, that was an excellent introduction to Eduardo's work, in fact. Yeah. I appreciate that. Plus, you built suspense and collaboration all at the same time. Awesome. Uh, Eduardo, are you able to share your screen? Yes, yes, one second. Um, Nathan asked the question if consortium members will have access to the trained models. Javier, what, what do you say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm in the process of, of creating a pretty beefy training set. And uh, I'm going to, I want to run some bench, benchmarks. So we are going to probably have like 500 trained models um, in, in a few weeks. Okay, awesome. And thank you very much, Javier. Nathan, I hope that answers your question.